Okay, so next questions, Nikita. Yeah, hey, hello everyone. So uh, I wanted to ask you if, uh, like when we are preparing our SOP and all, so uh, let's assume that if, I, if I've talked to some of the professors and I like their research area, and uh, so is it okay if I mention their name in my SOP, like this is the professor that, uh, so there are two different scenarios. So this is the professor I've talked to and want to work under and our research interests also align. And the other scenario is I have not talked to the professor, but I still uh, uh, want to work under them. So uh, is it okay if I mention their name in both of those or when will it be okay if I mention their name? I think it's not just okay, but it's actually recommended that you um, put in professors' names when you're interested in working with, um, so that they can also kind of take a second look at your application. Oh, that's... Just to add on, many times professors also, like if they don't have funding for themselves, they also recommend other professors working in the same field, uh, your application or uh, vice versa, they could also refer you to that professor working in the same field. So uh, it can be uh, beneficial, I think, uh, to, to add that name. Uh, it at least worked with me for one of my applications uh, in the UK, uh, where I wanted to work with one professor, but because she did not have funding, she actually referred me to another person who had funding, and it was a very similar project. Um, uh, so yeah, so it, it, I think it is beneficial. I will also add that don't only use one person's name from one university, at least have two, you know, so that gives you some flexibility. If one person doesn't have funding, at least the second person can take you. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Jasmine was also saying something. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to mention that, like Adi and Handita said, you should definitely mention the professor's names and sometimes in the application portal from what i remember you have to mention at least three to four professors so that the department knows whom to forward your sop to in case they don't know themselves or is it it is not clear and i remember in some of the places that i applied to there were some open day programs or orientation programs for interested applicants where they specifically mentioned where in the sop you have to write your professor's names so some places recommend you to write it right in the first paragraph some places want you to write it at the bottom so pay attention to where you're applying and what we prefer in such programs okay okay thanks a lot thanks a lot uh, just to just to add on for masters, it may not like it's okay if you don't uh, add specific names uh, in case like you are just applying for like a course based program or you want to just explore research options after mm -hmm. admission. Uh, in that case, it's it's okay if you if you don't apply, but for the uh, if you don't uh, mention names, uh, but for a PhD, it's it's an add on. Just just wanted to differentiate. Thank you. So I believe Ambarish has another question. Yeah, hello. I hope you can hear me. Uh, so um, I am a, a fourth year undergrad student from IIC Bangalore itself. So uh, I have a slightly different question, which is um, I'm thinking about applying for a direct PhD, not going for a master's. So uh, we often think about two different paths for PhD. One is uh, US based universities and the other one is like UK Europe based universities. So when we go for like think about UK or Europe based universities, they are mostly like three years PhD program, where in US and American universities are mostly five years PhD program. So what is the basic difference between them and uh, what we need to keep in mind when we apply for both of them specifically? I can get started. Uh, I So this might be limited knowledge, but I did have some experience applying to uh, uh, UK university uh, and US. So I was applying at the same time uh, for PhD. Um, so the, the one difference I did uh, feel was uh, in UK, at least for PhD, in, in UK, you do need a professor to work with you. 
uh, for your application. So the professor has a lot of, uh, the professor or your advisor uh, with whom you plan to work, their response and their, uh, you know, you, you often have to write a proposal. Uh, so you need to work with them uh, in order for your uh, for your application um, versus in the US it's like it, we do contact professors we do know whom to work with and kind of we do narrow down everything but the application process itself is sometimes like we mentioned it's independent uh, of the the particular advisor or professor so um, uh, so for you, for at least the UK university, I, f I feel that knowing and contacting and getting a response from the person you wish to work with is, uh, I think, a very, very crucial part in your application process. So that's one of the differences that that I saw. Uh, uh, the other thing is, I think, uh, at least from what I've heard, uh, in, in the UK, it's more uh, like the funding is, it's a three year funding typically, and uh, the students are usually stick to that time frame. Uh, versus in the US, time wise, it's a bit bit more flexible. You can also like get a GTA uh, after your GRA is done um, or, you know, other sources of funding. So uh, I think the time timeline is a bit more fixed uh, in, in the UK. Um, yeah, that's, I think the differences that I can think of mainly in the application process. But if somebody wants to add on anything, uh, at least these, this was my experience uh, with the application. I'll request all the speakers to promptly just jump in, <laughs> not waste any time. Just add your responses whenever you have. Uh, I can I speak to... for some experience of Europe, but uh, because I've not applied personally to UK universities, I'm not really sure. Uh, European universities seem as similar to what Nandita said. You had to work with the professor and just apply once you get accepted to a lab or a professor. So there are programs as well, and they're very similar to US programs. But if you're applying directly to a professor who advertised for a port, uh, post, then definitely follow what Nandita said. Uh, I can add to that, uh, Yogesh. Um, sure. Uh, so I think uh, for most of the UK universities and the universities in Europe, uh, they don't require you to uh, go through coursework. So it's just research. So that's why that is another reason why the programs are shorter because you just have to focus on your research. Uh, whereas in the US, um, at, as far as I know, you have to take a specific amount of courses and that also adds up to a lot of time because you need to have certain number of um, uh, credit hours before you can be eligible to uh, graduate. So I think uh, US and uh, UK and Europe uh, don't have uh, coursework requirements as such. And even Australia, I apply to Australia, they don't have coursework requirements. They, you just focus on your research, and uh, but but here you have to take coursework, and that takes up a lot of time. Thank you, Akriti. Akriti is another member in our WeLeap executive team, and she is doing her PhD from Florida State University in aerospace engineering. She's in the final year. I just wanted to give you guys some context. <laughs> Thanks, Akriti. Mm -hmm. Let's move to next question then. There was, Bukesh, there was a question in the chat. Um, the person says they can't read it themselves, so I'll read it out. Okay. So, for an eight pointer BTEC aerospace, two publications is purpose indexed journals and par participation in a bunch of competitions, which is my case per se. Is it too ambitious to apply for an MS in MIT? And what is the reality of an MS in MIT? Also, how reasonable is it to apply for a particular specialization without any work experience or internships? Okay, uh, I can start. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I my BTEC uh, CGPA was also eight point something, and uh, I did apply. However, I did have a master's, and I was able to increase my GPA by a consider considerable amount. So there was an upward curve there. And if you have publications or actually, I would say that 
there is no correct answer to this is it too ambitious or not it depends on the other places you are applying to how many universities you are applying to and if you have an interest in a certain research area and you are reasonably sure that you would get in i don't think we could really answer if it is uh if it is ambitious or not and your second question the reality of ms at mit i'm not sure i understand it it's as real as other programs and uh, yeah how reasonable it is to apply for a particular specialization without any work experience or internships so i think um, like they look at applications on a whole you said you said that uh, if you feel that your gpa is a little lower it would be better if you have some specific a uh, research experience or some other experience to kind of make up for it so that you have more things to show on your application so again again i think it depends on you i'm not sure how helpful this answer was thank you shina so um utkarsh has another question uh, you can unmute yourself and go ahead yeah i had one question like uh, is direct to letter of recommendation so like i'm aware of like for the applications in the us uh, for phd we need three letter of recommendation so i was wondering uh, uh, like which will be better like all of these three coming from professors or is it good to have an uh, a job experience like a corporate lor so i think out of these four which three set is better like um, views on that if i can uh, speak from what i've heard from professors while before uh, my application started professors definitely like recommendation letters from other professors and if at all you're giving a recommendation letter from an industry experience it should be in an industry that is related to um, what uh, the research uh, field or phd would be um, if it is not re related to it then they would be only able to talk about your interpersonal skills or your time management skills or if there are any other transferable skills that you think you can use from your industry experience to your phd but uh, from what i've heard from professors they prefer it to come from other professors yeah i think what 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 she said is that's true i mean i think it's better uh, to have a uh, Hello, like letters of recommendation from uh, academics or academicians, uh, and uh, also your any research internship if you've done with your your uh, your some professor or even if it's a company related to what you've done uh, really helps. I think that uh, professors prefer that uh, um, over um, industry experience, industry LOR. Um, I don't. Uh, to admit and just said um it's still important that the person who's giving you the lor knows you well so and i'm just uh, jumping off of what i thought oh i have unstable internet i'm sorry if you can't hear me well but um yeah if you uh, it, it's important to have somebody who knows you well so if you're out of university for a long time and if your professors may have like forgotten you or something um it's still more valuable maybe to have that industry um lor as long as the person knows you well questions uh, i i just wanted to get opinion of all the speakers on how did you start developing your sop and you know like what motivated you for that and how did you think about that sop could you share like you know just brief insight all of you um i can start um and i can also before uh, answering that question i can just briefly say something i wanted to say and something i wish i knew um i i think it's important to realize like there are cultural differences between india and the us and especially this is true when you're sending emails because things are a little bit more informal here um so when you're sending your emails you know so if you can do a little bit of research on that um that you know along those lines too as to how um you know email culture is or how you generally talk to professors i don't think it's going to come across as too negative but sometimes if you're incredibly formal it might sound a little odd so that's one thing and then the question that tukesh asked was how we went about our sops um i actually started the way i um i 
it's something that I said before as an advice that I started with self-reflection. So I sat and really thought about, you know, what my story is, um, why I'm doing what I'm gonna do, um, why they should consider me, um, you know, um, in, in contrast to many other applications that they'd be seeing. So I think for me, um, the, the objectifiable parts were already there on my resume. So uh, it's not like a whole lot of thinking to be done there. I already knew what I've done, uh, but the thinking really came from why I wanted to do this or what my actual story was, why I, um, what, what about this really interests me. So for me, most of the thinking was uh, on that area. Great. Shreya, would you like to add? Uh, yes, I would just like to add to what Adi said about self-reflection. I think I really sat down and thought, why why am I even trying to do a PhD now? And why why not anything else? What, about, what is it about this career that I see myself doing and would I think that I will enjoy? And are there some specific problems that I want to solve or uh, specific things that I want to do? And how do they relate with things that I've, that I've already done and how... The, like how I can transfer the skills I already have to this PhD that I will be doing, develop on it and, you know, become the person that I want to be. Like, I think just taking a few days. And of course, it was a very long process, many weeks. And I sent it to many people to review. And of course, don't take in all of their changes. But uh, I, yeah, I had a lot of people review it. And again, I sat down with it and understood why it seemed that I was trying to say something else or not. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Can I also are... add that um, yes, it's yes. important to be critical with everything that you write. Uh, just don't like write anything and be okay with it. Just go back and make sure that every sentence has a place in that SOP. You're not wasting space. That's the that's really the first thing that the admissions committee is going to see. So um, it's you in like a couple of paragraphs. So make sure that every line counts. And if there is a um, oh, this is more like what did I do, but I ended up making this as an advice, but um, I also made sure that um, the length requirements were met correctly. So if, if mm -hmm. the university said one page, then I made sure that it was exactly one page, not, not less, not more, um, yeah. especially if it's one page, I think it's good to use up like all the words, because again, that's the opportunity that you get to um, represent yourself. So uh, if it's short, make sure you use everything um, and just like stick to the Great advice. Let's go to Nandita and then to Jasmine. Yeah, I think um, uh, I, um, like I said, I applied for, for master's first and then my PhD. And when I uh, applied initially right after my BTEC, uh, it was more of a very, you know, hurried application where I was like, okay, you know, I, I'll, I'll just do this, I'll do this, do this. like it was a very, um, unplanned kind of application. So um, I remember the first time I wrote my SOP, I actually, it was it was at a point where I was like, I just have to write it, right? So my first draft was, I just wrote everything that came in my mind, kind of my story, whatever, you know, I felt like bad points, good points. I think I just wrote for a while um, and then I took my time to, you know, bring it down. And then I also, uh, of course, um, I read more, you know, also some SOPs and I spoke to some, like I said, some of, some of my seniors and some people who had gone through this process. And then that helped me kind of shape my uh, SOP a bit. So I, so my first, <laughs> the way I worked was the first thing was I just wrote. Uh, and then I took time to kind of, reflect and then you know shorten it and edit it and, and things like that and it did it did take a time but uh i had the the uh, fair advantage of i think applying for the phd later uh which gave me a lot of time to go back and and make that sop actually work for my phd so i i i think i had some time with that but um uh, yeah, like all, all that advice that uh, Adi and Shreya were mentioning, that those were like, those are the key, just like self-reflect and then write down and um, uh, 
yeah keep it precise to the point nobody wants to hear like a very very long story right um so yeah uh, i guess just just do it and then just write whatever you have and then uh, alter it and adjust it that's what i did yeah that's a great advice like first you write everything and then you just screen out the most important ones jasmine any insight any further insight <laughs> Yeah, so all of these points is really great. And I would like to add that I did a mix of both. I wrote some points, then I thought a little more, I wrote again. And uh, also talked to people who got into the places that I did, which was at a later stage. And this is a little tricky too as well to reach out to these people. And uh, But the advice that they gave and what worked for them definitely was a big uh, sort of pruning point for my SOP that I needed to add what is required and what was not required. And uh, yeah, and then again, after writing one draft, I gave it out to review and while I gave it to review, I sat and read it again after giving it a couple of days. And then, yeah, it was multiple drafts, but it was never, <laughs> never a perfect uh, SOP. And then you just send it because the time has come. So that is how it went for my case. Awesome. Thank you. So with this, we are at the end of our session. I would like to thank, first of all, of, to all our speakers for spending your time today with us and giving all these, you know, useful advices and tips. And there was so much to learn from, from each of your experience because you everybody has like their unique experience. So thank you so much. And uh, I believe the audience definitely learned something useful today. And I appreciate for people joining from India for staying up late and people joining from North America <laughs> getting up early for the session. So thank you, everybody. And hope to see you all uh, in our next sessions. And uh, I hope to stay connected with our speakers today as mentors in our upcoming sessions. So thank you, everybody. Anybody has any closing remarks, feel free to <laughs> convey them now. I actually do. <laughs> um, oh, well, just thank you for uh, inviting me to this thing. Um, but in general, I think it's important to be confident when you're um, you know, doing your applications. I um, kind of had that issue. I think in India, we are kind of taught to be humble um, and not you know, come across as too pompous or anything. But it, there's a fine line, um, I think, kind of treading along that line is fine just don't be too much on the humble side uh, being a little confident both when you're uh, you know putting in applications emailing professors which should be short by the way don't write like paragraphs and paragraphs they do not have the time to read that email um, so just like be confident um, and good luck to everyone thank you yeah thank you Durga, Shreya, and everyone to have us for this panel i hope we could contribute something in the form of advice to people who are applying to me. Thank you. Nandita, Shreya, any last words before we leave today? Yeah, I think good luck to everyone. And thank you, Durgesh, for, for organizing this. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was uh, you know very helpful. And if I had been at that stage, this would have been very, very helpful. Uh, I think one thing uh, that um, I uh, can uh, say out of my experience is that uh, yeah go all out like applying give your best at you know everything take out time and do this um, uh, properly every step of it um, give your time give your everything because you know this is your future and it, it, it deserves uh, your effort uh, and also um, don't be very conservative <laughs> like I was uh, go go ahead and apply it keep your list, uh, um, uh, make decisions uh, that suit you. Um, so um, yeah, good luck, good luck to everyone. And uh, please feel free to reach out, I guess, to all of us uh, uh, if you're, if you need help with anything. Thank you. Shreya. Yeah, I would just, uh, yeah, like say the same thing as Nandita, like, thank you for joining us and all the best to everyone. And uh, yeah, like I applied, look, as you saw, I applied to a lot of universities because I was pretty unsure about what to do and what not to do. And one thing I had was that I didn't want to have any regrets. 
that is why i kind of ended up applying to mit also although i thought there is no way i'm getting in so i would say that you know take some chances and uh, yeah all the best and please uh, feel free to reach out to us if you need any help thanks shreya glad that you shared that particular thing about mit because when i was applying for a postdoc at mit i was also under confident i was thinking huh, do you do i really have a chance and i am here like yeah you know sometimes we underestimate ourselves so it's better to have that chance take that risk and you know rather than regretting later so yeah i think we we all got some great advice here today thank you again for everybody joining thanks to our executive team for moderating the session thank you ankita thanks all the speakers thanks all participants and we will see you in our next session let's stay connected and let's keep learning bye everybody thank you. Thank you bye bye thank you bye bye